Anyway, this morning, I want to start off by talking about a good buddy of mine, um, Jim Norville. I don't know if he's in the sanctuary today. Is Jim in the sanctuary today? Oh, he's in the lobby. He's doing security today. Maybe Jim can hear me out in the lobby. Anyway, for those of you that know our very own Jim Norville, he's a character for one thing. He's got a saying and he's got a story for everything. He's a retired firefighter, so all those hours and days uh, in the firehouse, he's heard about every story, every punchline you can imagine. But here's the thing about Jim. Even though most of the things he says are funny, honestly, there's a nugget of truth in about everything he says. For example, one time he told me this. He said, do you know how to tackle the hardest project. He said, you find the laziest person and you give them the hardest job and they'll come up with the easiest way to get it done. I think he hit the nail on the head. Amen? As people, we like easy, don't we? No way around it. We like the easy route. We like the road of least resistance. Well, let me just uh, tell you this morning, when it comes to doing God's will or being in God's will, I'm sorry to bust your bubble this morning, But God's will is rarely, if ever, easy, but it's always right, and it's always best. It seems like God loves to take us off that road of least resistance and put us on the road, sometimes we think of most resistance, but at least much resistance, and I think that's because it's on that road that we actually realize who He is, and we actually realize who He wants us to be, and most of all, on that road of much resistance, we realize just how desperately we need Him. How many can say for a matter of fact that you found God in your lowest times? When things were the hardest, God was right there. There are situations that we know what God wants us to do, but in our own human stubborn will, uh, we don't want to do it. So today, we're actually going to be finding Jesus in an intense battle. It's actually an internal battle, But how many know, as we go through life, there are all sorts of battles that you and I face every day. Sometimes there are things that we don't want to do that we know we should do. You know what that is? That's a battle, an all-out battle between flesh and spirit. That's a battle between flesh and spirit. The Apostle Paul, I think, said it best, and I think we all could relate to this. He says, there are things that I don't want to do, and those are the things I end up doing. Think about it. That's the Apostle Paul. I think we're in good company if we mess up once in a while. Amen? How many of you have been there, done that? I've been there, done that, even got the t-shirt to prove it. Amen? It's like God's Word tells us, and it seems like God's Word is backwards to our human nature. It says we need to repay evil with good. What do we want to do? We want to repay evil with more evil, right? That's not the way God says to do it. Or we need, he says, to deal with our money in a certain way. And the thing is, a lot of times we know it deep down in our hearts. We just shrug it off and say, I know it, but oh man, I just don't want to do that. Sometimes it is hard. Like when God asks us to forgive somebody, you might be saying, well, you know, I just can't forgive them because you don't know how bad they hurt me. I know it's hard, but God still tells us to forgive. It could be relational. You know, you could say, well, I don't really want to remove this person out of my life even though I know they're not the best for my life. You just want to put it off and put it off and put it off. You may not realize it, but that is a spiritual battle. You're dealing with those things as a spiritual battle. There are all sorts of spiritual battles that we face in our lives. Maybe some of you are facing a valley today. It could be a valley of your own making. It could be. Or it also could be a result of this broken world that we live in. We know that death, sickness, and disease are all around us. But you could be walking in a valley right now, a situation right now that is literally terrifying you to the point that all you want to do is get away from it. All you want to do is run away from it. Let me tell you this, you're in good company too. Because in the text we're going to look at today, Jesus was trying to do the exact same thing. Yeah, you heard me right. Jesus was trying to run away from a very extremely difficult situation. We're still in chapter 14 in our series on the Gospel of Mark. And this is the third sermon in chapter 14 alone. You might be saying, well, why are you taking so long? Simply put, because it's important. This all is so important. It's written here for a reason. Actually, in the book of Mark alone, there is so much that we need to get out of this so that we can understand what God is trying to tell us. And at this moment today, we're going to be looking at Jesus 
he's hours away from being handed over to the authorities to be crucified. And to catch you up to speed, remember for the past few weeks, we've been talking about Jesus uh, spending some time in the upper room with his disciples, eating the Passover lamb. And all the time, he is showing them that he is the literal final Passover lamb of God who's going to be sacrificed, who's going to be slain for the sins of the world. And after that last supper, um, in verse 26, it says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. They went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's when that part takes place in the story. The Garden of Gethsemane is actually part of the Mount of Olives, if you don't know much about Israel. So Jesus leads this group. Now they're minus one. Now they're minus Judas Iscariot. He leads them out to one of his favorite spots, the Garden of Gethsemane. You might say, well, how do you know it's his favorite spot? I said it's one of his favorite spots because John 18, verse 2, it says that Jesus came to this garden often, many times with his disciples. You know why he came to this garden? To get some R&R, to get some rest and relaxation, to find some peace on the outskirts of town, away from the masses of people, away from the crowds. But everything is about to change for Jesus in our story. Everything's about to get very, very, very difficult for Jesus. You may not know this, but Gethsemane means olive press. That's what it means, olive press. Olives were a crop that had to be pressed or crushed to get their precious oil out of them. How ironic, or maybe I should say how appropriate, because the Son of God is about to be pressed by his enemies. He's about to be crushed by his cross so that his precious blood could actually be poured out to cover our sins. So before he can actually surrender his body over to the cross, guess what? He's got to surrender his will over to the Father. How many know before you do something big for God, sometimes you just have to surrender your will over to God and whatever his will is, whatever his desire is? Let me stop here for just a second. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, why a garden? Why does this take place in a garden? Like a lot of other things in the Bible, it's symbolic. Think about human history. It began in Genesis in a garden. So you've got a garden over here way back at the beginning, uh, a garden that Adam and Eve occupied until they were kicked out. And you know what else occupied that garden? Sin and failure. Sin and failure. And Revelations 22, you've got a garden in the beginning, the Garden of Eden. You've got a garden in the end in Revelations 22. It talks about the Garden of Eden actually being restored. This is actually going to be the garden city of the new Jerusalem. This is literally heaven on earth, the new heaven on earth. And it's where God's going to dwell with his people forever. I'm trying to bring out the point that you have a garden when the Bible begins. And you have a garden when the Bible ends. But in between these two places, in between these two gardens, the Garden of Eden and the garden city of the new Jerusalem, there's another very important garden, a third garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. How many know that in the Garden of Eden, the first Adam was overcome by sin, right? In the second garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, the second Adam, which we know to be Jesus Christ, overcame sin. The first Adam was overcome by sin. Jesus overcame sin. So what, did, uh, what Adam did in the first garden wrecked us. What Jesus in the second garden did was rescue us. Think about it. In the first garden, Adam said, not your will, Lord, but my will be done. Guess what? All creation plunged into sin. But in the second garden, the second Adam, Jesus, said, Not my will, but your will be done. And the salvation and restoration of mankind began. Amen? Think about it. Night and day difference. Think about it. What Adam broke, Jesus fixed. What he messed up, Jesus fixed. There's so much symbolism here. Look at verse 27. It says, You will fall away. He's talking to his disciples. He's not saying you might fall away. He says, you will fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. We mentioned this last week, but he's quoting from the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 13. And he's telling them that, hey, guys, you're all going to walk out on me. Hey, guys, you're all going to run out on me even before I die. And even though you fail me, I'm never going to fail you. And after I rise from the dead, he says, I'm going to meet you all in Galilee, and I'm going to put this mission that seems like it's falling apart, I'm going to put it back on track. Verse 29, Peter declared, even if all fall away, Peter says, I will not. I think Peter, being Peter, 
kind of full of himself, kind of a little overconfident because Jesus immediately goes into, wait a minute, Peter, in just a short time, you're going to deny me. Look at verse 30. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Not once, but three times. Look at verse 31. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. I can imagine all the other disciples uh, gathered around and said uh, what he said, Jesus. That goes for all of us, too. Now we're going to look at probably one of the only times, if not the only time, that Jesus really struggled with doing the will of God. I think this is probably the biggest picture you'll ever see of the humanity of God coming out. Uh, we have to remember that Jesus was 100% man human, right? 100% human, 100% God. And him being God, Jesus didn't use his godly powers to minimize his human emotions. He was real all the time, 24-7. Jesus knew the plan. He knew that God's plan, even though it wasn't a plan that he liked, was a plan that he would go to the cross. And you know what Jesus did? He knew about it, he understood it, and he embraced it. He even spoke about it many times. One of those scriptures is John 10, verse 15. Jesus says, I laid down my life for the sheep. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received, this command I received from my Father. So think about it. Three different times when he's gathering with his disciples, headed toward Jerusalem, he stops and he says, Hey guys, wait a minute. You've got to remember, I'm going to die in this place. And a few weeks ago, uh, we talked about Mary, how she broke that expensive bottle of perfume, poured it on Jesus. Judas rebuked her, said she should have used it for the poor. Jesus says, oh, no, no, no. She's anointing my body for burial. She's anointing my body for death. Then last week, we had communion. We looked at the Last Supper when Jesus said, this bread is my body, which is what? Broken for you. This cup is my blood, which is poured out for you. So Jesus, this whole time with his disciples, has been teaching them that all of this is going to happen. He knows it, he understands it, and he totally embraces it. Then all of a sudden, we see a glitch happen. All of a sudden, something changes. All of a sudden, maybe an hour later, it hits him. I think Jesus knew it up here, but it hadn't hit him in here yet. I think right then, it hit him right here where it counts. Jesus knows his hour is close. He's about to be arrested, betrayed. He's about to receive the beatings you can never even imagine. The cup of God's wrath poured out on him, the crucifixion. And now it hits him in his heart. He takes his crew with him to Gethsemane. When Jesus runs up against the biggest challenge in his life, you know what he does? He goes out to pray. When you and I run into the biggest challenges of our life, instead of running to him or her or them or that, we need to run to our Father in prayer. He runs out to that Garden of Gethsemane. He takes with his disciples. He takes three of the inner circle a little bit further. And then Jesus goes even further into the garden to do what? To pray. But you know what he's doing in his prayer? He's pleading with God to change the plan. He's pleading with God because he doesn't like the plan. He says, God, I want a different plan. Sometimes we don't think that way about Jesus, but he did not want to be there. He did not want to do that. Verse 32, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be, and listen to this, I don't want you to just hear this, these words, I want you to get it in your heart. He began to be deeply distressed, not just distressed, deeply distressed, and it follows it up, and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Jesus is saying, I'm so sad that I feel like I'm going to die. He says, stay here and keep watch. I want you to notice that word distressed in verse 33. You know what that means? It means to be in the grip of shuddering horror, in the grip of absolute terror. You may not realize how bad it was for Jesus at that moment. It was that bad and worse. He went from being someone who was confident in what God had called him to do, he spoke about it, he embraced it, to now he's totally terrified of what the next step's going to be. Totally terrified what he's going to be confronted with. Look at verse 35. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground. 
you're following along in your Bible, you might want to underline that. He fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour might pass from him. I read in Chuck Swindoll's commentary that that phrase, fell to the ground, uses the imperfect tense of that word, and it means was falling. That's suggesting that Jesus walked a short distance and he fell. He got back up, he walked a short distance, and he fell again. You may never have seen it that way, but for an hour, Jesus walked and he fell in agony. For an hour, Jesus walked and he fell in anguish, pleading to the Father for relief from the mission that God had set him on. He didn't want to be there. He didn't want to be doing it on his human side. He was emotionally distraught. And you know, this is surprising because this is the same Jesus that had total composure, that wasn't bothered at all when he walked right into a raging storm on the Sea of Galilee, he remained totally composed so much that he walked on top of the sea. He walked uh, through the waves. He was faced with demonic opposition day after day, satanic temptation day after day, the constant grilling of the religious leaders, and he remained totally composed. What happened? Here in the garden, Jesus fell to the ground, and he's agonizing in prayer. How many of you have seen that old picture of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane? I've got a little, uh, a little statue of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane on my bookcase at home. He's kneeling beside a rock. He's got his hands uh, together like this in prayer. Every hair on his head is perfectly in place. And there's a spotlight that's shining on Jesus. He looks so peaceful and calm. I can't imagine the Garden of Gethsemane being anything like that. Because it wasn't anything like that. And the Gospel of Luke says that he sweat as if it were great drops of blood when he was in his hour of prayer. And by the way, I want to tell you this, and most of you have already found this out before. Whenever you get into situations where you're deeply distressed, where you're full of anxiety, full of worry and fear, you're probably going to run into Mr. and Mrs. Holy Ghost Jr. I say that because we are. There's always somebody there to tell you what you're doing wrong. What, what, what am I doing wrong? You need to have more faith. You need to put more trust in the Father. I'm telling you as a pastor that I kind of want to lay hands on those people and not in a good godly way. Amen? <laughs> I think most of us would agree with that. But at this moment, my point is, Jesus, even being Jesus, was struggling. We tend to just think about his divinity, don't we? We forget about the human side of Jesus. Jesus was shredded at this moment. He was at his wit's end, and he grovels, and he falls to the ground. But I love his response in verse 36. He says, Abba, Father. You know what that means? That means Daddy. That means Father. That's one of the most intimate terms he could have ever used to describe a relationship. And this is the first time that, he, that we see Jesus saying that at all. He said, Abba, Father. He said, everything is possible for you. And catch this part. Take this cup, not the cross, but the cup. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. In the Old Testament scriptures, starting in Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then following it up over into the book of Revelation, the cup refers to the wrath of God. I'm sure Jesus was fearful to go to that cross, without a doubt. Who wouldn't be, right? All down through the eons of time, people have been martyred, killed for their faith. Think about Peter. When he was crucified for his faith, he says, Oh, no, don't crucify me like Jesus. Crucify me upside down because I don't deserve to be even crucified the same way as my Lord was crucified. But Jesus, in saying cup, you know what he was saying? He was talking about the absolute fury and wrath of God. It's a fury that he didn't deserve. It's a fury and a wrath that we deserved. But he prays to the Father that this cup would pass, that this hour might pass. In other words, he's saying, Lord, if there's another way to save sinners, Lord, if there's another way to reconcile them to you without me going to the cross, Lord, let's do that because I don't want to do that. So the wrath of God to cover the sins of every person from then till now would be poured out upon Jesus. All that wrath of God was going to be poured out on Jesus. That's what he was fearing the most. Have you ever noticed the way Jesus prayed? And have you ever noticed the way that Jesus prays is a whole lot different than most of us and most people tell us to pray? 
They say, well, when you talk to God, you need to name it and you need to claim it. You need to come with absolute confidence and boldness and say, Lord, I command this or I demand that. Let me tell you, that is the wrongest way to pray pray you'll ever pray. Because that is not a prayer of faith. That's a prayer of arrogance. None of us, who could we ever think we are to dare think we could demand anything anything from Almighty God? But even the Son of God didn't come and name it and claim it. You know what Jesus' method was? Request and then rest. That ought to be our method of prayer. Make your request and then rest in the fact that God's got it. Leave it up to God. Say, Lord, this is what I want, but whatever you want is more important. That's prayer of faith. That's a true prayer of faith. You know what the best kind of prayer actually is? When you say, Lord, well, I see it this way. But you know the rest of the story, and I don't. I see it this way. You see the whole story, and I don't. So whatever you want, Lord, that's okay with me. Whatever you want, Lord, I'll submit myself over to that. Let me tell you, you can't go wrong with that kind of prayer. Amen? So Jesus spent the last night of his freedom uh, begging God, pleading with God. And he's saying, is there any other way to save Bill? Is there any other way to save Dwayne? Is there any other way to save Janice? Is there any other way to get to you, Lord? There's got to be another way. Well, I hate to bust your bubble again, but there is no other way. There is no other religion, no other belief, no other book, no other philosophy by which anyone's going to get to heaven except through Jesus Christ dying on that cross. Amen? That's the only way. Jesus himself said, I'm not one of many ways. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if there's any other way uh, that someone could be uh, saved or get to heaven, why would we be following a God that sent his own son to a cross to die a torturous death? The reason for that is there was no other way. There is no other way. Look at verse 37. Then he returned to his disciples and found them, what? Sleeping. Notice what he calls him. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Remember, Jesus changed everything his name from Simon to Peter, but sometimes he still calls him uh, uh, Simon when he goes back to living like his old self, amen? He says this to Peter, couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Just one hour. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I've always loved that scripture because it speaks so much volume, so much truth. The flesh is willing, Um, The spirit is willing. No, the the flesh is also willing. (laughs) The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Look at verse 39. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. He goes back a second time. He asked the Lord God to abandon his mission, to avoid the wrath of God and the punishment for sin. Look at verse 40. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They didn't know what to say to him. I would imagine uh, that would have been a little embarrassing. Jesus, in his darkest hour, and his uh, closest uh, disciples are taking a nap. But before we get angry at them and too judgmental at them, let's be honest. Whenever you make a plan or have a plan to sit down, maybe in the evening and you're going to pray, maybe for an hour, you start praying and pretty soon uh, your head starts to nod a little bit. Start to doze off a little bit. How many have been there? How many have done that? You pray for an hour, and I guarantee you at the end of that hour, you're not saying, boy, that hour of prayer was so easy. It's not. We've all been there. It's hard to pray for even an hour. Sometimes it's hard to pray for five minutes. What about reading the Bible? You find when you sit down and you read and pray, your mind starts wandering? You start getting a little bit distracted? Isn't that when all the phone calls start coming in, all the text messages hit you? Your mind starts to wander, then you start thinking about, well, what I got to do tomorrow and the next week? Or if you're like me, in my office, I've got a chair with a footrest on it, and I have good intentions. I'll sit down, and I'll put that footrest up, and I'll lean back to have, uh, you know, an hour of prayer. It might involve a little snoring. I don't know. No, I doze off. My eyes get heavy. We've all been there, done that. And why do you think that is? I'll tell you why. Could it be that Satan knows there's power in prayer? Could it be that Satan himself knows that there's power in reading the scriptures of God that reveal the Spirit of God? And you know what he wants to do? He wants to take that power away from us. And you know how he does it? Distractions. 
He tries to distract, you, distract us, get our focus off of what it should be any way, any old way he can. Just a suggestion, I know when I start getting distracted when I'm praying, you know what I do? I start praying out loud. You know, if nothing else, I can hear myself praying. That keeps my focus for one thing, and it's more like really having a conversation with God, which you really are. Some people around you might think you're nutty, but it's the best way to pray, especially when you're distracted by so many things going on. Look at verse 41. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While the disciples were sleeping, think about it. The enemies of Christ were plotting how they could get Jesus. There's a principle here of watching and praying. And I do believe with all of my heart that every day, every moment, every hour, there is a meeting that's taking place in hell. There's a meeting that's taking place in the darkest places of the heavenlies with a strategy, the sole strategy of kill, steal, killing, and destroying. Stealing, killing, and destroying our spirituality. And I can back that up with Scripture. Ephesians 6.12 It says, We don't fight against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I believe there's a whole lot of evil going on in our heavenly realms today. If you don't know that, look around at our world. Amen? And I say that to say that's why we need prayer all the more. You and I ought to be on our knees like we've never been before for our country, for our world, for our families, for everything uh, we're connected to and even disconnected from. We need to be praying because prayer is one of the most powerful tools that God has given us. Amen? Let's see where I'm at here. Okay, I know where I'm at. I made you nervous. I was even more nervous, believe it or not. Did you notice something changed, though? We've been talking about Jesus before he prayed, after he prayed, there was a night and day difference. Something clicked, something changed. Before he prayed, he was deeply distressed. He wasn't himself, deeply distressed, falling on his knees, saying, hey, I think I'm dying from all of this worry and fear. And then after the third prayer, he gets an answer from his father. I'm not saying it's an answer he wanted or liked. The father says, son, there's no other way. He said, uh, son, you're going to have to drink from this cup of suffering and wrath. When I think of this scene with Jesus standing there with sweat rolling down his exhausted face, all of a sudden, from hearing the story before, all of a sudden something changed. All of a sudden Jesus rises up with the heart of a lion. And he says, rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus was no longer shrinking back. He was no longer running. He was moving forward with courage. He wasn't running from it. He was moving toward it with all the boldness that God could give him. Amen? So how could Jesus submit to whatever the Father wanted? I'll tell you how he could. Because he knew the character and he knew the nature of his Father. He submitted to his Father because he knew that nature of the Father was to be a good God. To always do what's right. And to always, 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 even when it seems like it's out of control, he's already always in control. Amen? So think about this. Knowing all that Jesus knew about his father, he says this, Nevertheless, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Not mine, but thine be done. The whole reason Jesus could rise up is because he first knelt down. Think about it. The whole reason Jesus could rise up with that much strength and power was because he took time to kneel down. The reason he could stand up is because he first bowed before the Father. And it was through prayer that he found his strength to overcome his own earthly will, overcome the temptation of what his flesh wanted him to do, to finally be able to do the will of the Father. I believe somebody, okay, all of us need to hear this this morning. When you bow before the Father, you can stand up against anything. When you bow before the Father, you can go through anything. When you first take time to bow and kneel before Him, and just like Jesus, you can begin to walk straight into that storm. And I don't care how big and bad that storm is, because you can walk into that storm because you know that Jesus is with you every step of the way. 
Think about Jesus. Just as he entered the Garden of Gethsemane, every one of us are going to have to enter our own Gardens of Gethsemane. Some of us are going to have many. And it's going to be a time where we'd rather avoid doing what we should do because doing what's right is going to cost us dearly and hurt us deeply. It's not going to be easy. It's in these times that we also get deeply distressed, full of worry and fear, just like Jesus did. And you're going to find out a lot of times when you go into those circumstances and situations, it seems like your friends kind of walk away. Sometimes they're not there to support you, sad to say, just like it was with Jesus. What I'm talking about, the way to be spiritually alert every day is to pray every day. Don't just be a hit and a miss when it comes to prayer. The way to fight Satan is to talk to God. And the way to overcome temptation is to lay it all before God in prayer. You realize prayer is not a way for you to get whatever you want from God. Prayer is a way to get whatever you need from God. Amen? Starting out with His grace, His mercy, mercy, His protection and direction. You've got to catch this part. Prayer in this text didn't deliver Jesus out of His suffering. It didn't. But you know what it did? It delivered Him through His suffering. You know, we as people want Jesus to take us out of our suffering and deliver us through it. Do you realize prayer is one of God's main provisions for our endurance, for our perseverance? Without a prayer life, let me just tell you, you're not going to have much strength in your life. If you don't have an active prayer life, you can't even, de- you can't even ask God to answer prayers that you're not even praying. Amen? God is faithful if we'll just trust Him. We need to be faithful to him. Prayer in this text brought him through what he was going through. Prayer is a way to access God's grace. Do you realize that? In a special way. Prayer brings God's presence and protection. Prayer is a way that God leads you, guides you, strengthens you, helps you along the way. I heard somebody say this. Kind of hard to say, but it's prayerlessness leads to carelessness, which leads to sinfulness. Prayerlessness Prayerlessness leads to carelessness, which leads to sinfulness. I don't think it's any coincidence that Jesus prayed for three hours, and all of a sudden he had the strength and the power to walk all the way to the cross, to go through the crucifixion. The disciples slept for three hours. All they could do was abandon Jesus in his greatest hour of need. Let me tell you this morning, this message is about prayer, and prayer makes all the difference. When you're in a spiritual battle, you pull out the big guns. When you pray, you're pulling out the big guns. We need to stop saying this. And we say it all the time. It's like, well, I guess all we have left to do now is pray. No, that should have been the first thing we did. Amen? That's our big gun. When you bring out the big prayer gun, it's like taking a loaded gun to a knife fight. I mean, how many have ever seen Indiana Jones movies? I always think back of that, about that part in the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark where he meets up with this Egyptian a guy that's very, uh, a very skilled swordman. And this guy's uh, uh, waving this sword around in all directions. And Indy's like, I don't know what to do now. Bow whip, you know. Then he pulls out a gun out of his pocket and he goes, bang. End of story. Kind of a special part of the movie. And it ties into this in a weird way. It's the weapon that changes the fight. It's the weapon that changes the fight. And guess what? Today our weapon is prayer. Guess what? The devil wants to take that weapon right out of your hand. Because he knows there's absolute power in prayer. So let me ask you the question of all questions today. You could have never guessed what I'm going to ask. How's your prayer life? Do you even have one? How is your prayer life? Are you one of those people that just pray to get? Or are you growing in your relationship with Almighty God because of the time you spend on your knees praying to the Father? The key is praying until you get the answer. And this story right now tells us even Jesus didn't get that answer right away. What he had to do, he had to keep going back to the Father. He had to keep going back to the Father as many times as it took. I believe we need to learn to trust him, people. We need to trust him even in our darkest hour, maybe especially in our darkest hour. And the truth is, if Jesus didn't abandon his mission for you and me way back in the Garden of Gethsemane, guess what? He's not going to abandon you now. He's not going to leave you nor forsake you now, even when it feels like whatever you're going through is squeezing the life out of you. So if you're struggling this morning, Jesus is here. If you're struggling this morning relationally, emotionally, physically, financially, spiritually, all you have to do is turn to Him. 
All you have to do to turn is to turn to Jesus. You can trust him because he has proved over and over and over again that he's never going to let you down. People will let you down. We let down each other down every day. But I can say this with 100% assurance. Jesus will never let you down. I've let him down a whole bunch. But he's never once let me down. Someone wrapped up the 14th chapter of Mark like this, and I love this. Each of us must decide whether we will go through life pretending like Judas, fighting like Peter, or yielding to God's will like Jesus. We all have a choice, right? I want to please God. I want to choose to follow Him. It's not the road of least resistance, I'll tell you that. But I will tell you, it's going to be worth every, every ounce of energy you put into it. Every ounce of faith you put into it. Could you stand your feet? There is absolute power in prayer. And there's absolute power in surrendering your will over to God's will. So this morning, if you're here today, if you have a need, I know Carmen prayed for needs, and I do believe miracles were taking place when Carmen's praying. Not because it's Carmen, but because it's the Word of God. And it's the truth of God. But if you're here today and you feel the pulling of the Holy Spirit pulling on your heart, I invite you to come down front. Pam and I and Carmen will be down here to pray with you. If you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you need to win a battle that you're fighting in your life, maybe it's an internal battle, no one else can see it, no one else knows about it, God does. I encourage you to invite Him to walk on in with His power. Bring the power of Almighty God, the power of His Holy Spirit that rose Christ from the dead to bring it into your life. So this morning, no matter what your ailment is, your problem is, don't be embarrassed to come while I'm closing in prayer. I invite you to come because I believe this could be the turning point of your life. In whatever situation you're in, this is a turning point. I believe God brings us to turning points all along our journey. This is one for somebody. This is the turning point. Don't turn and walk out of this room without making the turning point to come down front and meet with Jesus, find out what he has for your life. Could you bow your hearts in prayer? Heavenly Father, I love you today. We love you today. I thank you, Lord God, that you showed us a human side of who you are. That, Lord God, you've never gone through anything that we haven't ever been through. You've already went through it. You've already went through it without any kind of sin, without any kind of failure. And you're here to help us that fall and stumble every day. Help us all to realize the power of prayer today. Lord, you're so faithful. And you've proven to us over and over and over again that you're never, ever going to let us down. I thank you for that faithfulness. Help us to be more determined than ever in praying, trusting, and seeking you until we get our answer. Lord, I pray for anyone here today that might be struggling relationally, physically, emotionally, financially. But most of all, if they're struggling spiritually today, Lord God, I pray that they would allow you to be their help. They would allow you to be their Savior. I thank you, Lord God, for being a real God, a God that connects with our hearts. Turn us, every one of us, to you today, Lord God, more than ever before. When we walk out of here, I believe Carmen prayed in her prayer, let us walk out of here changed, different than when we came in, more focused on prayer, more focused on reading your word, more focused on serving you like never before. Lord, I love you for this message. Uh, uh, I love you for this text. I think it's a supernat- thank you that it's a supernatural word to help us with the supernatural problems that we have. In Jesus' precious name I pray. And everyone said, amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. If you need prayer, we'll be here.